Those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Hundreds of thousands of people filled the streets of London today, hoping to get a glimpse of the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Up to two billion people around the world are believed to have watched the festivities, a story which has dominated TV news for weeks. 8,000 journalists are covering the event. British police launched a massive security operation around the event. The Guardian newspaper reports Scotland Yard raided five apartments in London on Thursday, preemptively arresting 14 people. Some of those arrested were reportedly involved in the large street protests on March 26th against budget cuts in Britain. Controversy has also arisen this week over the royal wedding guest list. Syrian Ambassador Sami Kiami was disinvited amidst reports of Syria's brutal crackdown on peaceful protesters. But the former head of Bahrain's National Security Agency is in attendance, despite allegations he oversaw the torturing of prisoners with electric shocks. Sheikh Khalifa Ben Ali Al Khalifa is the current Bahraini ambassador to Britain. Human rights groups have also criticized the royal family for inviting representatives from Saudi Arabia, Belarus, Burma, Morocco, Equatorial Guinea, Swaziland and Zimbabwe. Joining us here in New York is a British journalist who's openly criticized the wedding hoopla. Johan Hari is a columnist at The Independent of London. One of his most recent columns is titled, This Royal Frenzy Should Embarrass Us All. He's also the presenter of the Johan Hari podcast. Johan, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to be with you. Well, Talk about your country. Talk about this royal wedding, all the attention. And most importantly, let's discuss empire. Well, I'm here as a refugee from the royal wedding in New York, so, although it seems you can't escape it anywhere. But, the, you know, nobody objects to two people who love each other getting married. You know, that's a nice thing. It's nice for anyone to see it. You know, we've got no problem with that. Well, we, depending on their sexual orientation, some well, countries do. That's, that's a good point. But the, uh, indeed, Elton John was there and he wouldn't be allowed to get married. He's not allowed to get married in Britain. But the... The thing we really object to is the institution of monarchy and the fact this has turned into a celebration of the idea that my country's head of state is selected, not by voting, but by squelching out of a particular aristocratic womb in a particular golden palace, which doesn't seem to me to be a very sensible way to select these things, and it, and it causes very serious problems. For all the other flaws of the American political system, your head of state grew up on food stamps. My head of state grew up on the postage stamps. You know, you can tell your kids in most democracies, if you work really hard, if you appeal to enough people, you can grow up to be the symbol of our country. The fact that the symbol of our country is selected solely through the most snobbish criteria of all, bloodlines, who their parent was, has a disfiguring effect on the whole of British society. It creates a kind of snobbery that emanates out and emanates down. When you're a British kid, you grow up seeing that people instinctively bow and grovel before someone just because they happen to have been born in a palace. And I think that does have a deforming effect. And to what degree, uh, by the reports that we see, the sense is that all of the British public is enthralled with the, with the event. But what are the, what's the reality in terms of public opinion uh, within Britain? No, that, that's not true. Most British people will have any excuse to get very drunk and have a party, and we're glad for a public holiday. But no, most people are benignly indifferent. They'll watch it on the television for 10 minutes and get on with something else. Around 20 percent of the British people, which is a disappointingly low figure, but it's still a lot, believe that we should be a republic. The figures, the polling suggests that it's going to be much higher when the current Queen passes away. When you get to that point, you have considerably higher figures for, for having a republic and people wanting a say in who should be our next head of state. Talk about the movement against royalty in Britain. Well, we have to deal with some really weird arguments, Republicans. So, for example, the monarchists always say, oh, it's really good for tourism. Actually, of the top 20 tourist attractions in Britain, only one of them, number 17, is related to the royal family, Windsor Castle. Ten points ahead of it is Windsor Legoland. So using that logic, we should have a Lego man as our head of state <laughs> instead of these people. You know, then they say, oh, the monarchy is a great defender of democracy, which in itself seems logically absurd, you know, well, let's not democratically elect our head of state in order to preserve democracy. It's also, for people who talk a lot about British history, incredibly historically illiterate, the last uh, British monarch but one, Edward VIII, literally conspired with Adolf Hitler to run Britain as a Nazi colony. He urged the Nazis to bomb Britain more during the Second World War. So the idea that heredity throws up people who defend democracy is bizarre. And, and this issue of, of, uh, of empire that really gets talked about, that the, the queen was not only the queen of, 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 of England, but also of the commonwealth of nations, of, of the British commonwealth that all came out of the colonial empire? Well, 
Britain is a country that really hasn't come to terms with its imperial past, if you compare it to a lot of other places like Germany and the, crime, the awareness they have of the crimes that were committed there. Most British people, for example, just don't know about, the, for example, the famines that happened in India in the 1870s and 1890s that were caused by the British. There was a natural crop failure, and Lord Lytton, who was the British governor, ordered that the grain be forcibly requisitioned and shipped to London. 29 million people died in those famines. You know, if you look at the figures, he banned the idea of relief efforts. He said it would make the Indians weak. The very good and honourable British people, and there were some in India, who tried to feed the poor were punished and imprisoned and deported. You know, instead he built labour camps for the, for the starving Indians where the calorie, the daily calorie count was lower than at Buchenwald at the height of the Nazi atrocities. You know, who knows about that? You know, there's a fantastic book called Late Victorian Holocaust by Mike Davis that really details them. But instead, pro-imperial historians, this guy called Andrew Roberts, who was invited to the White House under President Bush, gave a great speech. Big defender of the behaviour of the British Empire, an apologist for the Amritsar massacre, where they openly massacred, you know, peaceful protesters. That, that's all we really hear about the empire. Uh, let's talk about Kenya for a yeah. minute. The British government is facing a lawsuit over the repression of the Kenyan struggle for independence against colonial rule. A group of veterans of Kenya's resistance movement have filed a suit in British courts seeking compensation for human rights abuses during the Mau Mau rebellion of 1952 and 1960. More than 100,000 Kenyans are believed to have been killed in the British crackdown. Ituwa Kahangarari is a Mau Mau veteran and spokesperson for the case. The colonial regime in Kenya at that time had robbed all our lands, had broken almost every human right against us, and we were living at that time in our country like, like slaves. And therefore, we rose up and say we must see that Kenya recovers its uh, freedom and it is land. Johan Hari, talk about Kenya and its relation to the current U.S. president. Well, these are ghosts that are really returning at the moment in the form of this case. The British invaded Kenya in the 1880s because they wanted more, more land, and uh, they seized the most fertile land in Kenya. They banned the local people from growing the cash crops like coffee um, and began to commit terrible atrocities against the people there in order to steal their land. Eventually, in the 1950s, there was a mass uprising against this, and the British reacted by forcibly removing all of the Kikuyu, all the people who lived in that area, all the population. Anyone who objected was moved into a massive concentration camp network. They were detained there. There was mass torture, pouring boiling wax into people's ears, raping people with bottles. This has all been extensively documented. One of the people who was detained in, the, in those camps was Barack Obama's grandfather, who was basically broken in those camps, never recovered. Um, and, what yeah, was his involvement in the resistance? We don't, well, they basically swept up all the Kikuyu men, as far as we know. His family claimed that he didn't do anything. Uh, of course, it would have been perfectly legitimate to resist violent imperial occupation of your country. But as far as we know, he didn't do anything. They were just mass punishing any man of that age. It was, it was a huge crackdown. And, you know, a lot of these lessons of British imperialism, the places that continue now, there's a great irony. The British Empire was the first place to aerially bombard Pakistan in 1924. President Obama is now aerially bombarding Pakistan. You know, this guy whose grandfather was put in British concentration camps is now following the script that was laid out by, by British imperialism. And, of course, the, the, the British role uh, in Asia uh, as well, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Opium War, in, in, the, uh, in the colonization of Hong Kong for, for so long, until only recently, until only about a, uh, about a decade ago, uh, the, uh, the role there. The stand-up comedian Chris Addison, the British stand-up comedian, said uh, one of the great things about being British is you can look at every part of the world and say, yep, we screwed that one up. But it's worth remembering there were always great British people who were anti-imperialists who argued against this at every stage. There are people who said, this is an atrocity and we shouldn't be doing this. Just like, you know, democracy now is part of the great American tradition of resisting the crimes of the American state. There have always been British people who fought back and argued against this.
and sided with the peoples in those countries. Well, let's talk about today. The guest list for the royal wedding includes not only dignitaries and celebrities, but also practitioners of torture and other human rights violations. One invited guest, Sheikh Khalifa bin Ali Al Khalifa, is the current Bahraini ambassador to London and the former head of Bahrain's National Security Agency, an agency that's accused of electric shocks and beatings. Bahrain has in recent months been racked by protests as government has been accused of unleashing a violent crackdown on political dissenters. Bahrain's crown prince was also originally invited to attend the wedding, but declined. Uh, yesterday, we reached Nabil Rajab of the Center for Human Rights in Bahrain for comment. This is what he had to say. Uh, sorry, we, we don't have that clip, but can you talk about um, the Bahraini guest? Well, at a time when our governments claim they're bombing Libya to protect the Libyan population and because they're opposed to human rights abuses, some of the worst human rights abuses in the world have been invited to be fawned over in, in, in London today. You know, you had the Saudi royal family who horsewhip women if they have the temerity to sit behind the wheel of a car, who horsewhip the victims of rape. You know, you had the king of Swaziland who murders trade unionists, murders Democrats, murders dissidents. You know, uh, you had, as you mentioned, Bahraini torturers. You know, and it's worth seeing the contrast between Libya and Bahrain. The British Foreign Secretary, William Hague, our equivalent to Hillary Clinton, said, admitted in an interview recently, that a motive for the bombing of Libya is to lower the price of oil. Contrast that with Bahrain. You know, Bahrain is a place where the, uh, the oil flows just, you know, just past Bahrain. It's where the American bases are. You know, the contrast is very clear. If you're essential to our oil supplies, we'll fawn over you. If you uh, mess with our oil supplies, if you're disobedient in supplying your oil, you get what, what happens in Libya. Let's try to go to that clip of Nabil Rajab of the Center for Human Rights in Bahrain. Disappointing to see the invitation for the wedding is being extended to our ambassador to London, especially taking into consideration his bloody role as the head of the national security apparatus, which is responsible for gross human rights violations since he was in power. Fortunately, this has not been taken into consideration by the people who invited him. Uh, I think this is a sad message uh, to the people of Bahrain and to the victim of torture. I myself was uh, attacked by the forces uh, that belong to the same institution. I was attacked severely and I was admitted to hospital and I was approximately two weeks in hospital getting treated for my pro the problem I had because of the attack, which I still have the same problem till now. That was Nabil Rajab of the Center for Human Rights in Bahrain, Johan Harry. It's worth bearing in mind what's actually happened in Bahrain. We've heard a lot about the heroic uprising in Tahrir Square. There was a similar uprising in Bahrain, a place called Pearl Square. The Bahraini government have physically demolished Pearl Square. They've knocked the whole thing down so demonstrators can't even gather. Massive repression of the Shia population there, who are a majority, being viciously suppressed by a Sunni dictatorship. Um, you know, and what do we do? We welcome them and we fawn over them. It shows that our language about you know, respecting human rights is tragically deceptive. Uh, I want to go back to the wedding for a second. Uh, what is this costing? Who's paying for it? Uh, and also, um, what does the Ma the maintenance of the royal family cost the English public. Er so when you said you year. wanted to go back to the wedding, I suddenly had an image of you in a large hat, a <laughs> large frilly hat, which is delightful. Uh, the wedding's costing about $100 million. Uh, they claim it's been paid for by the royal family's budget, uh, by their private wealth. And you say, well, where do you think they got their money from? They haven't been out, you know, doing anything productive lately. Um, overall, the official figure is the royal family costs about $260 million a year. Actually, that's a deceptive figure because there's loads of things that aren't included. So, for example, whenever the royal family go and visit a foreign country, they charge their clothes bill to the local embassy, for example. So it costs a lot of money at a time when Britain is going through really extreme austerity. You know, Charles Windsor, the heir to the throne, has over 60 personal staff. He has someone who um, puts his toothpaste on his toothbrush every morning. He's never done that. You know, we're talking about real opulence. You know, he has three personal chauffeurs. What do they do when they need to transport him, cut him into three pieces, you know?